here we go! Welcome to Close Combat. I'm Sergeant First Class Dan Wiltshire. Coming up, we'll have all the light heavyweight action in the Army Championship Combatives Tournament. But first, a closer look at modern Army combatives training and how it's being used downrange. The techniques you're about to see are constantly evolving depending on what's effective or not in combat. We can't go around killing everybody. We could just use these techniques that we learn here to control the person and still feel confident that we have control over the situation without having to resort to deadly force. We teach boxing, kickboxing, uh, judo, wrestling, and Brazilian jiu-jitsu all in one system in a matter of four weeks. Give them drills that they're able to uh, continue training after they leave here and uh, pass that on to their soldiers. So as they're learning to choke people, do takedowns, whatnot, they're also learning how it plays out with a rifle or how it plays out with a knife or with a pistol on you. Or, how do you know if the opponent is armed? Because imagine, you get in a fight with somebody, how do you know if they have a pocket knife on them? Well, you don't. So that means you have to fight everybody as if they might. The situations that I did come in contact, I didn't have the combative training and I struggled a lot more hands up, hands up. to control those people because I didn't know the techniques that I've learned in level one and two so far that really show you how to control somebody. You know, they do the two-on-one yeah. drill where you got a two-man take down a person and, you know, and then eliminate the threat from that person, which is, I think, one of the best techniques that I've learned so far for a combat scenario. We want them to break through them barriers so they can find the confidence in themselves, you know, uh, that warrior ethos, you know, you know, the defining characteristic of a warrior is the willingness to close with the enemy and that's the big thing about combatives is you know the same thing it takes to, to get into a fight and to fight someone is the same kind of stuff that it takes to engage the enemy on the battlefield. You're in a firefight you go black you have no ammo left you know and the enemy's right there on you and you end up having hand to hand or you're you're clearing rooms you know in tight knit quarters uh, depending on your rules of engagement, you know, you, you're not able to fire your weapons, so you've got your uh, enemy combatant right there on you. You've got to take them down hand to hand. Because everybody has to be ready to fight. Um, everybody's a soldier first, regardless of MOS or, or duty position. Your first priority is a soldier, and you never know when you're going to need that. When you take it down to the soldier level, they have to be confident that they can handle themselves. Uh, in all situations, we want them generally to be to step forward and say, I'm here to help. Every soldier is going to be in a situation uh, where they're going to be in or around an enemy or, or in enemy territory. But regardless of what your job is in Iraq or Afghanistan, you're in enemy territory. So you need to be prepared for that. As we know, each service has a different mission, and each branch has a different approach to hand to hand combat. Here's a look at the Air Force program, which is based on modified Army combatives training. All right, first thing we're going to do is go over the fight stance this morning. You're down, bring it through, you're right here. Shield up. Everybody say shield up. Shield up. Everything that we teach is on the ground. It gives them the sense that if they find themselves in a hostile situation, what is easy to learn and can I defend myself if I find myself in that situation? Airmen are on the ground outside the fence uh, in today's um, joint expeditionary air force doing things and finding themselves in positions that they may not have found themselves in a couple decades ago so or, or even a few years ago so this is tremendously important to be able to, to at least have a have a basis from which to know how to defend themselves all right reset reset a lot more intense than I expected it to be. Um, I thought we'd, from what I'm, I'm used to, my past experiences told me that when we came out here on day one, it would be kind of by the numbers. Um, they taught us what we needed to know, and then we got to apply it. 
His legs are always up. You say leg like a belt, foot like a hook. Say it. Leg like a belt, foot like a hook. You fall back holding your elbow, you're not going to break an arm by accident. In this class, we only break arms on purpose. Definitely demanding. It's a little bit tougher than a regular PT regimen because it's a full body workout. You're constantly on the go. You learn new things, have to try new things. Um, technique is very big, so you're trying to learn technique but also match the moves at the same time. All right, you see how he's able to pull you in like that? Yes, sir. When we say good car bar pass? Oh, yes, sir. Sure. That way when he tries to pull you, you're right there. When we deploy, we're prepared with a skill set that if in the event we have to engage the enemy at close quarters battle, that uh, if our weapon jams or if they close the distance where we can't use our primary weapon, that we also have another tool to defeat the enemy. And he's going to scissor his legs just like a pair of scissors. And now he's on top in the mount. Okay, basic mount position, just like in a third grade fight, right? On the playground, you get on top of the opponent. Anybody seen a Christmas story? And Ralphie gets on top and he just starts beating away. Think of that. We still are in the early stages of the program. Right now, the officers uh, at OTS, the Air Force Academy, and here at ASBC at Maxwell get the training. Eventually, we hope to move to BMT. Uh, it got started here at Maxwell in uh, January of 08, and it's kind of progressed since then. But we really look to, to bring it to, to basic military training one day and to be out there training with the enlisted corps as well. The other arm going underneath the armpit with an opposing thumbs grip. Everybody say opposing thumbs grip. Comes the interest in this combatus program is, is phenomenal. It's to the point, you know, we're, we're getting calls here at the academy daily from, from young airmen, young officers all across the Air Force trying to, to lean forward and do more and more and more out at their units. So it's tremendously popular. It's a great experience. Um, I think every airman should know how to use hand-to-hand -hand combat uh, in case of the fact that they're called upon to go down range and uh, need to have this uh, tool set in their kit bag. You've seen how the Army and Air Force trains. Still ahead, a look at the Marine Corps program. Plus, don't miss all the light heavyweight action from the Army Combatives Championship. The first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna go over um, drill one which consists of three different moves. It, talks, it uh, covers the arm push and roll, where the man on the bottom is trying to improve his position, and he will trap his opponent's arm and his leg and roll him into what is considered the guard position. Now his opponent has him in the guard. Now the next move is he's gonna try to escape the guard and go to side control. And here he's in side control, and his next, his next move will be to achieve the mount. And, it, and after he's done that, you'll see that he's gone from the man on the bottom to the man on the top. He's improved his position each time. And now he's in, in a position to win the fight or finish the fight. Level one, again, is uh, all about improving their position. So we'll go off of the same thing that we talked about in uh, the first drill, off of the arm trap and roll. So the opponent on the bottom, he tries to do, to do the arm trap and roll based on what the opponent on top is doing. But the opponent on top sees it coming. So as he does that, he creates space. And this gives the man on the bottom the ability to move out. What he's done is he has shrimped through that space into the guard. Now he's going to go from the guard, and he can finish the fight in, in three ways. All right, he can either use a, apply a choke here, apply an arm bar, or sweep to the mount. In each position, he's either finished the fight, or he's improved his position to a place where he can finish the fight. I'm Van Stokes, here with Matt Larson, director of the Army Combatives Program. Now, Matt, you were ringside at the annual Army Combatives Championship. Tell me, how are other services getting involved? Well, this tournament is for the Army only, 
So that means that to be in this tournament, you have to be assigned to a unit. Now, we've had people from other services do quite well. We had a sailor come in second, and we had an airman come in third, but both of them were assigned to Army units. So it is possible for other service members to become involved if they're assigned or attached to another Army unit at an Army installation. Now, Matt, what does it mean to win this competition? Well, imagine 1.2 million soldiers and all the attachments and whatnot. To be the best out of 1.2 million is pretty high. Thanks, Matt, for helping us set the stage. And now, let's meet a few of the fighters. Today, Tony Belasco and Richard Starks competed for the bronze medal in the light heavyweight division. I think definitely the, the competition is important because it teaches aggressiveness, uh, initiative, that kind of thing, stuff that is successful on the battlefield and helps uh, soldiers you know, win the fight. I think it's, it's definitely becoming up a big thing because the Army's starting to recognize it for the capabilities because every time you go into a room, you never know if that dude's right behind the corner and somebody missed that guy so he can attack you from behind. Definitely, definitely a good thing. So you never know. You have to be ready for whatever the battle might bring you. What do you think about these strategies, Matt? I think Starks has got the right idea. He's probably the better wrestler, and he's smart enough to know it's his defensive wrestling abilities that will really turn the tail. If he can keep it on his feet and win in strikes, it should do him well. Belasco could have his work cut out for him. Well, let's get to the action. That's Richard Starks in the blue belt from the Maneuver Center of Excellence here in Fort Benning, Georgia. And also from Fort Benning's Maneuver Center of Excellence, Tony Belasco in the red belt. Belasco very quick with that upper body takedown. And then comes right back with the striking. Now this is the light heavyweight division. And Matt, talk about the weight. Up to and down to. This is up to 205. And down to as big as your courage is to get into the arena. <laughs> Wow, coming out on top is Belasco. Starks finds himself, excuse me, Starks in the blue belt on top, and Belasco finds himself in the bottom position. And again, they both wear the same kind of uniform. The only differentiating mark is that belt. Yeah, it's, it's funny. Uh, Belasco was doing pretty good on the takedowns at first, and we expected the, you know, the West Point wrestler to come out, but, but now it's gone the way that, that Starks thought. He's on top. We'll see what he can do from there. Yes, Starks had that, uh, I'm going to call it that quiet confidence, that calm, cool, collected confidence as he starts to pound the head of Tony Belasco. Seemed like Starks came out a little bit slow, and that's why he got taken down. But you can see he's, he's picking up the pace now, gaining the full mount. What is Belasco's objective? And aside from coming out, he does that very nicely, I might add. They go belly to back, and then you see that wrestling move, that pick up and throw back down to the mat. And this integrates a lot of sports and a lot of physical activity, be it wrestling, be it boxing. You can see Belasco working for that arm lock. He's giving it up now. He's got a half guard, so the one leg is wrapped up. Doesn't seem to be holding it that tight. Trying to make a full guard. There he has it. And that full guard, explain that. Enlighten our viewers, if you will. When you talk about the full guard, what does that mean? Well, you can see how Belasco's got his legs wrapped around him and using both legs to defend there. That's the full guard position. And now he's up. Belasco comes at him, but Richard Starks counters very nicely. I think he started to go for that guillotine choke, but, you know, that's a, that can be a mistake. The guillotine is only effective if you're able to get the full guard with it. So now, once he was in side control, it's time to let go of it. Sometimes you've talked about exuberance. You've talked about maybe lack of keeping your head about you. I mean, that can work against you at some point. Not to say that either one of these combatants are doing that right now. It's like Starks working an arm lock here, but Velasco powers his way out of it. Does a good job. They come back to their feet. And you see the extension right now on Richard Starks. The hips way back. The same with Tony Velasco. Yeah, both of them are really vulnerable to knees here. If they'll think to throw them. There we go. Now, both of these combatants from Fort Benning, Georgia, do you think they know each other? Is, are, are they familiar with their, each other's styles? They, they do know each other, but Starks is in training, so he's only been here a short time. Velasco is, is a drill sergeant, so he's been here a while training. Starks grounding and pounding right now. Back to the neutral position. 
and you look at their eyes. Pretty good focus right now. Nice duck under and then the takedown. You know that's that's one of the things if you want to take the guy's head off it's sometimes very easy to take you down. That's a bit of a risk. I think Belasco went at him overextended but Starks very calmly and coolly ducked under it and then drove him down to the canvas working on that Ben arm bar again. Belasco's doing a good job of defending it now he's keeping in that armpit that's how, that's how you keep him away from that arm. Now Starks mounted. That's a dangerous tendency. It's, it's twice he's rolled over to his belly like that to try to get out, and that, that's a bad habit. Why, why is that such a bad habit to get into, man? Well, like many combat sports, to have a penalty for having your back on the ground, but in combat, the penalty is for having your back to your opponent. So turning over like that gives the top man a chance to set his hooks in, right achieve there. the back mount. Right so in other words, when you are belly to back, so to speak, with your opponent, you really, and you're, you're in the down position, or out in front, you really can't see what your opponent's going to deliver or try to do to you. That's right, and if, if he's on your back and he's got his hooks in, and you, it's really hard to defend his punches, his chokes. You got Richard Starks in the top position now, Tony Belasco. In the bottom position, roughly 30 seconds remaining in this the first round. And Stark scoots out quickly. He tries but that in the choke again. Yeah. Very difficult to finish that choke without the guard. How about the technical skills of each of these guys right now, Matt? No, they, they're both much more athletic and have good wrestling skills. Some, the, of the, some of the more technical skills are missing. That's a good example, trying for that guillotine without locking in the guard. And you can see when Starks was on top, his, his basic plan is to punch him. He has tried that Ben Armbar a few times. So Richard Starks comes back to his corner. There you get a good look at that young soldier from the Maneuver Center of Excellence right here in Fort Benning, Georgia. What do you think his counsel is right now from his coach? Well, that's Townley Hedrick. He's one of the battalion commanders out at base of training. Really, really solid wrestler. Actually has been involved in the combatives program since the beginning, since maybe 96. And uh, he, he's got some solid advice. I'm sure what he's telling him is to keep with his game plan. It looks like, like Starks winning at this point. Yes, at this point, you probably would have to give the edge to Richard Starks. Once again, it's a 10-point must system. Three judges, different locations around the ring. The winner of each round must receive 10 points and then his opponent accordingly nine points eight points seven points again depending on the issue of clear dominance. That's right and, and you know you tell them when they go in there if you leave it to the judge it's somebody's opinion it's just their opinion Ooh, nice right hand there nice striking by Belasco. And again Starks. Very much extending that upper body, moving those hips out, making it difficult for Belasco to attack either with the knee or with the fist. Well, the real way to defend knees is to stand upright and push in. Of course, that gives the strong takedown guy some chances to take you down. But you can see that, that posture, if they would know to take advantage of it, is, is not really where you want to be. Now, Matt, what kind of safety devices do we have in play here? Of course, you see the gloves, six ounce gloves. Uh, six ounce gloves. They're Boy, nice boy. he is Starks is right in on that body. He controls that upper torso and then just drops Belasco to the mat. So you've got the six ounce gloves. Of course, a mouthpiece, a cup, and they're wearing shin and instep guards there as well. Okay, the protective groin device we're talking about. Belasco trying to fight from the down position, but now pounding him hard is Richard Starks. Starks seems to be having no problem getting past those legs now. You'd have to say he's got the edge in this round, much like he had the edge most likely in round number one. Again, this is light heavyweight bronze medal match we're watching. I think that's it. I think that's it. And it looks like that's it. It looked like he got the arm bar on the, on the far side there. Got the arm bar and Belasco still down on his knees. He knows he has been in a fight still on his back. Catching his breath as Richard Starks walks over towards his side of the ring. Let's take a look at that again in slow motion. It came up very, very fast. You see the left arm of Belasco trapped, and then he gets 
the arm bar in the right arm, and Belasco has to tap out. That was the same arm bar that Starks had been looking for unsuccessfully in the earlier round. I think he was just waiting for that one move to pop up. He got the move. He sunk it nicely. Belasco had to tap out. Now, let's hear from our winner. So tell me, how did you get that submission at the end? Well, I knew it was in really great shape. I kept kind of throwing punches, kept him on the bottom, wore him out. I'd be able to lock that arm out eventually when he got tired, get that submission. Do you have any shout outs for anybody? Yeah, 4th Platoon Charlie Company has the best fighters in the Army. All right, thank you very much. Congratulations. Back to you. Let's hear it once again for your winner in the light heavyweight division, representing the MCOE, Richard Starks. Coming up later in the show, we'll be back with all the action from the gold medal fight in the light heavyweight division. Stick around for more close combat. The other things that we cover in uh, week one of the basic instructor course is boxing. So what we'll have now is we'll have demonstrators put on the uh, gloves and the pads and we'll go through some of the things that we teach in boxing. Okay, in boxing we teach them four basic punches and we put those punches in combinations, kind of like drills. All right, we begin by teaching them the jab and we teach them the cross, the hook, and the uppercut. And we put these in combinations. Now we have combinations one through five. All right, combo one. Combo two. Combo three. Combo four. Combo five. These become drills that they can continually train on and continually practice, uh, not just here in the gym, but wherever they're at. Welcome back to Close Combat. The Marine Corps has its own combatives training. McMap, or Marine Corps Martial Arts Program, traces its roots back to the trench fighting of World War I. It's come a long way. McMap is a, is a whole Marine program. It's not singularly focused on the fighting aspects of, of martial arts. Rather, the focus is on emphasizing the complete development of Marines. So the next thing we got is controlling techniques. From day controlling one, when Marines come in, they very essentially start from the basics, uh, going over the tan belt, gray belt fundamentals. Essentially, from there, we're going to teach them different techniques. This is week two of a three week course. We showed up at 0630 this morning, which today consists of doing the obstacle course three rounds in less than 30 minutes. There's a little competition, losing squad, ends up with the log. Because everybody knows a competition, people usually work a little bit harder. Three. Next go around, and everybody's fighting and pushing harder, not because they don't want the log. The physical discipline is the training and the honing of our martial skills, our combative skills, along with the combat conditioning that's essential Pretty intense right when you start off. And then more involvement with this week is actually body sparring. We're going to teach them different techniques. Shoulder throw, hip throw, counter to the knife. Just different techniques you can use downrange that you don't get day-to-day -day basic training. Through the Marine Corps Martial Arts program, we're seeing Marines that are physically and mentally fit, they're physically and mentally tough, they're able to handle the challenges of today's modern battlefield, and they're doing it in, in superb fashion. This whole course is pretty demanding, but as long as you got the mindset that you're gonna complete it and do what it asks of you, you should get through it. It's pretty painful, but 
pain is just weakness leaving the body. So. Each year, the Army Combatives Competition is held at the Paul R. Smith Gym. The facility is named for the 2005 Medal of Honor recipient who was stationed at Fort Benning, Georgia, the home of modern Army combatives. Paul R. Smith was an engineer, uh, platoon sergeant in, in 3rd uh, Infantry Division. And um, during the battle for Baghdad at the airfield, his platoon was attacked by a superior force of Iraqi uh, insurgents. I ran back to the to the area where Sergeant Smith was, and he was firing his 50 cal. So I yelled to him to come out of there. <clears throat> but there was a large force out there, and he wasn't about to leave his position. He kind of gave me a cutthroat that he's not going to come down. Every time it was more linked, he just told me to get back down the driver's hatch and keep my head down. You could hear rounds tinking off the front of the track and stuff. And that's when he took the shot. I seen the enemy force out there. And there's no doubt in my mind if he hadn't stayed on that 50 cal, um, they would have came through our position. And, uh, and as they fought to hold that piece of ground, uh, they received withering fire. He moved up in uh, unprotected into uh, M113 and manned the machine gun and saved the lives of his soldiers as he fought and, uh, and repelled the enemy attack. And in retrospect, sitting back, thinking about when he left, mm -hmm. I think he knew that he would meet his destiny in Iraq. To have uh, the best gymnasium facility that I've ever seen named for a non-commissioned officer who gave his life for his country and for his own, you know, right down to the essence, his own men, and, and a recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor, it's the right thing, and he was a warrior, and to have the combatives tournament here uh, also shows our young, young men and women that they're a part of something bigger than uh, just themselves also, as was Paul R. Smith. Up next, a closer look at how competition improves technique on the battlefield. Plus, more light heavyweight action in the Army Championship Combatives Tournament. Stick around. Week two, we introduce uh, Muay Thai boxing. All right. When we do that, we'll teach them kicks from the rear leg, which we call a 10. And then we teach them kicks from the front leg, which is a switch nine or a step nine. And we'll go ahead and add these kicks into our combos that we've already taught them. Go ahead, combo one. We've seen the practical combat applications of combatives. The program requires intense training, and soldiers stay motivated by fighting each other. Here's a look at how these techniques are tested in competition. The competition, I think it's, it's great because it drives people to get better. I trained up for the competition and I was running six miles you know, a day just to up my fitness so for the competition I wouldn't be winded and stuff like that. I mean, it was a great motivator for me not only to improve my physical fitness but also to learn more techniques and try to become better at the combative side.
competition is important because uh, it, it gives the guys a reason to train. Bring your elbow up, hook, bring it back, drop. If you just give a guy a set of techniques, you know, and say, all right, this is, this is combatives, but you'd never give him a reason to train it, he's never going to do it. It's just going to be these techniques, and they're just going to kind of go away. And that's kind of what's happened in the past with the, the combatives programs before, is there was no reason that the soldier, you know, he got a little bit in basic training, and then he never did it again, because there was, there was no, nothing put in place for him to keep training. So now we give them guys a reason to train. You know, competition uh, instills the warrior ethos. It allows them to be champions. And uh, it builds the unit's free decor and pride in their unit. The competitions are gender neutral, um, but the physiology of males and females is different, so there has to be an allowance made to make it fair. And imagine that a female of a given body weight carries less muscle for her body mass than a man of the same body weight. I did compete a couple weeks ago. It was my first competition, and I just only knew level one techniques. That was it. But I just went in there and did what I basically knew. And I did pretty good. So what we do, and this is you know, based on the, the PT FM, we give an allowance, a weight allowance for females, so that it's really a fight between a certain amount of muscle rather than for just aggregate body weight. But that's the goal, so that at the end of the day, a soldier's a soldier. You know, still got that name tape and that US Army, and that's what matters. Whenever you're going through the door, nobody's you know, checking who's male and who's female. It's time to fight. Up next, see the competition in action. We're back ringside for the light heavyweight championship match in the Army Combatives Tournament here on Close Combat. All, right, all the skills that we teach them in the first three weeks are to get them ready for combat. One of the drills that we do for this is called the two-on-one drill. All right, we, we never try to attack an opponent by ourselves if we can help it. Okay, so what we do here is, is uh, we have two demonstrators in their kit, and we have a bad guy here. The bad guy is going to try to attack them, all right, while they're trying to control the situation. And they'll finish the fight, put him in a, in a position to cuff him up and take him back to the fob. moves become more difficult as they're doing it with their cool. combat equipment on. So we have to spend time practicing it with our combat equipment on so that we know what works, what moves that we can do with them on, how we can get around our own weapons, get our weapons out of the way so we can apply the different techniques. I'm Van Stokes, back with Matt Larson. Now for the final fight in the light heavyweight division, let's meet our competitors. Brandon Wallace and Jason Eggleston fought for the gold in the light heavyweight division. Let's hear what they had to say leading up to the fight. My strategy basically is the, is the principles of jiu-jitsu itself, is to utilize what the situation requires at the time or uh, utilize what's, what's given to me or what I can take, you know push, pull, pull, push uh, uh, strategy. He pushes me, I pull him, he pulls me, I push. Well, being a wrestler, I'm a ground and pound guy. Um, I'm okay on my feet, um, okay at boxing, so I'm in and out. Um, and once I see an opportunity to take him down, I go after it. If there's no opportunity to take him down, I'm, I'm okay with being on my feet and standing up and trading punches and whatever happens, happens. So, Matt, it takes a lot to get here to Fort Benning, Georgia. But this is a three-day tournament. It takes a lot to get to this championship round. Tell me about it. 
Well, you know, Van, the uh, chief of staff of the Army once said that he, every soldier should know who the, who the best fighter in his squad or his platoon is. Competition is really the key to that. And you can see this at every level of the Army, all the way to the top, we need to know who the best guy is if we're going to value fighting as a skill. Well, let's see who's going to get to the top of the light heavyweight division. Let's go to the action. Jason Eggleston in the blue on the right of your screen and to the left in the red and on the leg and the drop is Brandon Wallace of Fort Meade, Maryland on the attack early, Matt. Looks like he did a good take down there. He's already in side control. Working for a mount position. He's in half guard now. Struggling to get out from underneath Jason Eggleston from Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, 77th Engineering Company. So you have the engineer against the military intelligence soldier, that being Wallace. You've got a wrestler against jiu-jitsu participant. So uh, very interesting the way this one shapes up. But you'll see that a lot in this competition. It doesn't make any difference whether you come from an infantry unit or another unit in the military. This is combatants. Every soldier is a combatant first. Well, that's one of the things about this is you never know who the toughest guy in the Army is. It might very well be a cook or, or you, as you see here, in military intelligence or an engineer. It could be anyone because you're exactly right, man. It's for every soldier from day three of basic training throughout their career learning how to be a fighter. And these fighters have come to this competition from all over the Army, from the Pacific, from Europe. And of course, from right here in the United States. That's right. You can see Wallace there trying to get past that guard. He's got to get free his arms, and he, he's not having a very good time with it. Eggleston trying to work his guard up higher. You can see him pulling his leg up there. That's called the rubber guard. He basically is trying to get his legs up so he can control the shoulder, shoulder girdle. But Wallace got out of it, and he looks like he's Passing the guard pretty well, maybe not. Well, who's got the advantage right now? I mean, we've seen a lot of grappling on the canvas in this boxing ring. Well, generally speaking, the guy on top is winning, and that, that's a that's a pretty good rule of thumb, especially whenever punches are involved. So you'd have to say Wallace is winning, although in the guard is a strong defensive position. So Eggleston has, has got a lot of potential to, to uh, do some damage from the bottom. That is Jason Eggleston in the bottom position right now. Brandon Wallace in the red belt on the top. And they come back to their feet in a neutral position. You see them both taking the boxing stance. I was going to say it wasn't going to last long. Is moving very quickly is Jason Eggleston. Looks like Wallace has another takedown. He's got the legs wrapped up there. He's trying to work his way up the body, get into a side control position. Eggleston able to reform the full guard. That full guard, again, is when those legs come around and lock over the middle torso of the top man. You can see the relationship of the hips there. The man on the bottom, his hips are in position to affect the top man's shoulders, which is why that's a strong defensive position. So Brandon Wallace in a pretty good position right now. He is, although although Wallace can throw punches from the top because he has gravity on his side. But every time he does, he's in danger. Eggleston can use his hips and can use his arms to defend him. You can see how how he has his left arm on the inside there. And Wallace trying to pummel back to the inside, get a better position. Now you use the word pummeling. And that's just working your upper body, trying to get that strategic advantage over your opponent. Yeah, it's kind of swimming your arms into the better position. And, and what the better position is, is different from place to place. So, for example, here, having your arms on the inside is the better position. Roughly under one minute remaining in this round. It's like Eggleston's trying to work up to go for an arm bar, but... Wallace knows his game. You see, he brings that leg up there to, to place pressure on the shoulders to keep him down. The top man really needs to have good posture, and, and by that I mean upright. He needs to have his tail in lower than his head. 
in order to have good leverage. And right now it's slightly elevated. Doesn't have that leverage as you just indicated. Brandon Wallace in the top position in the red belt. You see little splotches of blood on the shirt of Jason Eggleston. Pounding of the mat indicates we're just about less than 10 seconds. Wait a minute. Did he stop so, it? Yeah, that so, was it. It was an arm lock. Arm lock in. Wallace gets the arm lock in. And there's With a only tap out. Seconds and this to is, go. This With, is over. You heard the pounding of the mat in less than 10 seconds. With only seconds to go, he got that arm lock. He got the arm lock in. Let's take a look at it again. Now, this came up very, very quickly. Well, you can see how his arm is there on the inside, and, and Wallace is extended, and as Eggleston puts the pressure on that elbow, that's it. So a lot of times, Matt, whether you're on the bottom or whether you're on the top, you can sink that arm bar in, force the tap out in the submission. Well, the key is the hips. You can see the man on the bottom, he's got the hips to affect the arms. The top guy can't really do that to the bottom guy, although he can land more punches from where he's at, and it's really the offensive person. The guard is a very strong defensive position, though. So he used his hips, he controlled that arm, and he won the light heavyweight gold medal. Well, let's hear from our winner. All right, good, good match. How'd you pull that off at the end there? Well, um, it's something I practiced for a little while. I always get taken down back at my academy. I got to work on my wrestling. But first off, I want to try to, I want to dedicate this to my, my stepdad that passed away in March. My mother was supposed to be here. And I just wanted to make sure he was here with me to make sure I could do this. I want to say a special shout out to everybody out here, all the doggone fighters, my team, everybody overseas. And most of all, Command Sergeant Major coming out and supporting us. Thank you, everyone. So Matt, you can learn a lot from that competition. Particularly if you're Eggleston, you're in the down position, but you still find a way to win. That's perseverance. That's it. And you know, in the real fight, it's the it's the one who quits. We used to say, you know, you, you can't quit in a real fight. It's just really easy to beat you up. So that's what you see. No quit, stick in there, working for an angle, no matter what's going on in the fight. So put this in the proper light. Why is this competition so important to the Army Combatives Program? Well, you can see these men are going to take that attitude and what they've learned back to their units, and they're going to take it down range. So when them or their soldiers find themselves in that life and death fight, they'll have the skills and the mentality to be able to persevere and win. Thanks, Matt. Well, congratulations to Jason Eggleston for winning gold in the light heavyweight division. For Matt Larson and our entire broadcast crew, I'm Van Stokes. We'll see you next time on Close Combat. Here we go!